Let's find our space, our place on Mother Earth, Earth's lap on this Mother's Day. Coming home to our the mother that we all share. Honoring the mothering that we've received and given in whatever ways. Mothering can be channeled through many different kinds of bodies. Uh, nourishing, supporting, encouraging, loving. Beginning again with compassion, with dedication. Caring for others, putting others before oneself. And as we come to our seat, uh, in whatever way we are positioned, it could be standing or lying down, but um, we use the expression taking our seat. Let's honor the, the caretakers, the ancestors of the place on earth where you are now situated where each of us is situated. The indigenous peoples, wherever you are, here in Kanyankahaga, uh, Chichaga, Montreal, it's the Kanyankahaga people, and many peoples, many indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land. Giving the honoring and remembering of indigeneity is a way of also remembering our interconnection with all of life, which is so intrinsic to the indigenous cultures here and around the world. And we can encourage ourselves and one another to keep an open inquiry as to what it means to be residing, sharing these lands with the indigenous peoples still here still stewarding, still advocating for the earth as in its wholeness, in her wholeness. How can we be part of that? How can we affirm that, engage in that? Also honoring our spiritual ancestors of this lineage, the early Buddhist tradition, uh, whatever lineages you may be nourished by, your personal ancestral line lineages that we are carrying forward as ancestors for the future. We are the ancestors um, in formation carrying forth these traditions to those who will come after us. So in gratitude for the ancestors from which, from whom we've received these teachings and in, in hope and love 
for those who will come after us, for whom we keep them alive. So one of the ways that we keep the tradition alive is to um, chant the refuges and precepts, which are uh, these refuges in different forms are a part of um, all of the traditions, the Buddhist traditions. Uh, so I will open them on screen and um, So I, we're going to chant them in the Pali and feel free to engage in whatever way you like. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, chant them out loud. Please, uh, those who are here with me, please feel welcome to chant them out loud. Um, they're, they're very simple um, kind of uh, melodies and you can uh, catch on, I'm sure, very quickly. Uh, the, the pronunciation of the Pali is a little bit, uh, you'll notice that it's not quite the, the English sounds. Uh, sometimes they're a little bit different, uh, but you'll catch on to that too. So, and, and mistakes are part of learning, so it's fine. Don't, don't, don't feel shy to uh, make a wrong pronunciation or go up when we're, I'm going down or whatever. Um, so the refuges, our practice of, when we say the word refuge, it evokes safety. It evokes uh, a place to, of shelter. And that's what these are. They're shelter from the storms of samsara. Um, the, just the, the ways that we get caught up in the collective drivenness of our society uh, and, uh, and the traumas that we're all experiencing now, uh, the trauma of war, the trauma of racism. Uh, so whatever our ethnicity, whatever our identity, we're all affected by these traumas of consumerism, capitalism, uh, and, um, and, and racism and uh, injustice and poverty, it, it, it impacts us all. And, and so as we learn to take that refuge is an inner experience, like finding that awakeness, that stillness, that presence that is present, that is available to us at any time. Um, we, we learn to be with the intensity of suffering around us and sometimes within us um, and, uh, and know that uh, we have the potential to be free, you know, even, even if the conditions are difficult. So, uh, so these, these refuges are a beacon of freedom for us. So let's begin. So we begin by honoring the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddham Sarananga Chami Tamang Sarananga Chami Sangam Sarananga Chami Duty Ampi Buddham Sarananga Chami Duty Ampi Damang Sarananga Chami 
Dutiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Budang Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Damam Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami So the precepts, as we chant these precepts, they are uh, a reminder of our aspiration to live in a way which is not harming other beings. So, um, so not harming by violence, not harming by taking what's not freely offered, not harming by lying, not harming by being mindful in how we manifest our sexuality, uh, not harming in not living in a way that uh, is out of addict, a drivenness, a kind of addictiveness, addic addictive um, habits of mind, uh, which override our sensitivity to the impact of our behaviors on others. So each of these precepts also has a positive iteration and we can contemplate that. So what does it mean positively, you know, if I refrain from destroying life, if I, dis if I refrain from violence in my life, um, how can I support life? How can I be supportive of the, the life force of other beings? How can I... How can I, if, I, if I'm not going to take in a way that uh, harms others, how can I be generous with myself, with my life, with my resources? So all of these, it's a way that we can, it's something that we integrate in our lives and it's, it's part of mindfulness, you know, like in this moment, am I taking something that's not being freely given? Uh, am, I, am I cutting off um, in some way of being unkind? Am I cutting myself off uh, being insensitive to others? So it's a, it, these, are, these are inquiries which can inform our life. They're deeply part of the Vipassana practice. Anati pata veramani sikapadam samadhiyami. Adinadana veramani sikapadam samadhiyami. Kame su michachara veramani. Sika padam samadhiyami. Musa wada veramani. Sika padam samadhiyami. Sura maria maja pamadatana veramani. Sika padam samadhiyami. Ida misila maga fala nyanasa pachayo ho tu. Sadu, 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 anumodami. I love the statement at the end. I rejoice that these trainings in peaceful conduct, bring about knowledge of the path. Knowledge of the path is, you know, like each moment that we wake up in the midst of reactivity, you know, anger or, you know, greed, like 
just mindless eating or, or uh, feeling just reactive and just, you know, turn and bring our attention inward and recognize that that's what's going on right now and that we have the option to, to not be driven by those energies, but actually to be aware of them. With kindness, with compassion, like that's knowledge of the path. And, and these precepts help us to cultivate that knowledge of the path. And the fruits of liberation, which are joy, and compassion, and love. So, so, so I rejoice in, we rejoice in these practices. So, um, So some of you uh, heard as I was uh, recapping. Oh, I'm going to um, I'm going to spotlight um, myself, which is just helpful for the recording of these. But uh, for those of you who are um, at home, if you want to see gallery view, you can change the view on your Zoom screen so you don't have to spotlight me but I'm just doing it for the recording. So I was explaining um, some of you uh, online came came on while I was explaining to some people who are here for the first time that we've been going through the Satipatthana Sutta and today uh, and we've been working on the uh, five aggregates the five khandas or skandhas um, so these are often called, uh, in the Buddha refers to these five, uh, they're the five skandhas is translated as aggregates, but it's more literally heaps. So it's like kind of heaps of stuff like that the Buddha categorized what makes up living beings, sentient beings. And so these are form, you know, we have a body. So we all have form, uh, an ant has a form, a bird has a form. Um, and, um, and then feeling. So I, I was just talking uh, earlier about feeling tone, vedna, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Um, and the third is perception. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And the fourth is, uh, and it's mental formations, um, but I'm going to focus on um, volition, intention, volition, and uh, consciousness is the fifth. So in the next few weeks, we'll cover, um, we'll cover uh, volition and consciousness, and then move on to the awakening factors. And that's where I will probably end uh, we're going to take a summer break on July 16th because I'm going to be away a fair bit. Um, and um, I'm not going to talk about feelings, uh, even though last week we did the body, uh, but we spent quite a few weeks on feeling tone, Vedna, um, back in whenever it was winter that we did those. If you want to review them, uh, you can find these, these talks uh, through the True North Insight website. And um, if you just look on the, the YouTube tube channel and you'll see that all of the Satipatthana uh, talks that I've been giving over the course of the past year are there. So you can, you can review them, you can explore any that you haven't heard. There's a lot on the Satipatthana Sutta and there are many more, um, you know, profound teachers than I uh, who are teaching this. Um, there's a lot that's available online. And as I, um, as I mentioned, as I mentioned throughout the course, I've been referring also to this book by uh, Bhikkhu Analyo. It's called Satipatthana Meditation, A Practice Guide. 
uh, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, he, um, he, he streamlines the, the practices. So he doesn't go through, like he doesn't deal with the aggregates because he feels that the five aggregates were added on later uh, that, that the Buddha probably in this fourth section of the four foundations or four establishings of mindfulness probably focused on the hindrances and the, the awakening factors, the five hindrances and the seven awakening factors. So anyway, that's a lot of numbers and words and I, I don't wanna, but I wanna, I do wanna talk about perception um, and how, how perception is something that we cling to. So the Buddha called these five, these five khandhas of clinging, how do we cling to these? And how does this distort the way that we understand ourselves as, as beings, as, you know, as who we are? Like, that we cling to the body, we cling to our fe feeling tones and we cling to perceptions. And so first of all, what is perception? What is perception as it's used in the Buddhist teaching? How is this, how is this word defined? Perception has to do with naming things, uh, has to do with language. So, uh, so right away, we can understand that, that perception is um, shaped by our language, by our culture. You know, we hear a lot about how, uh, like a word that uh, you know we may uh, we may use for something in in French or in English um, brings a different you know a kind of experience of what that is you know mm -hmm. I mean even just that in French nouns are gendered you know <laughs> like that is a whole um, <clears throat> that's a whole shaping, uh, even though it may be subtle. <clears throat> um, in, you know, indigenous peoples talk about how important it is to, <clears throat> to retrieve their languages because these languages um, express a way of connection with life, with other life forms a relationship to the whole that is very precious. Um, uh, so, so language is important. We each have a name, you know, and, um, and so when somebody calls our name, you know, that, and if your name is said, you know, with love, you know, like Sam, <laughs> so good to see you, April, so nice to see you. I didn't get your name. Leo. 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 So glad you came. Uh, yeah. Veronique, Miriam. Yeah. So, I mean, when somebody says our name, it touches us. We feel recognized. We feel seen. So names are important. Names help us to uh, distinguish. You know, um, I'm... I'm trying to remember the name of this uh, hanging plant, which I know so well, and, uh, and it's not coming to mind, but helps us to understand that this particular plant uh, or this particular tree has certain properties. It, it needs certain kinds of conditions for its life. Um, you know, as I get to know someone, uh, I associate certain experiences that I've had of that person with that particular person, you know? So, so my mentor uh, is named Marcy and, and I, you know, when I think, when I, you know, name Marcy or when I see Marcy, I, I associate all the very many positive, supportive and um, awakening uh, engagements that I've had with her, but I don't know all of Marcy. You know, Marcy has a whole life outside of her 
outside of uh, you know her engagement with me and um yeah so 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 i associate certain kinds of experiences with the name marcy and uh and she's much bigger than that you know she's more whole um, and um and so we so naming has uh, a way of separating an, a, a being or an object from outside of its context, focusing in on it uh, and, and helping us to distinguish it, which is, you know, a human capacity, which is, which has, uh, open to very much discovery and um, an engagement with the world around us. It also has the um, uh, the the nature or the characteristic um, or the, uh, the word I'm looking for the the dynamic or the effect of of separating out as if it were existing on its own. So we think of ourselves as separate. Uh, we think of ourselves in a way as fixed. Um, and, and yet, you know, in every moment we're breathing. <laughs> like in every moment we are feeling the, uh, the temperature of the air around us and it's having uh, an effect on how we feel our bodies. Um, uh, in every moment we are, um, we are digesting, you know, we're digesting what we had for breakfast and it's fueling our bodies and the blood is coursing through our bodies and oxygenating and, and feeding the cells of our bodies. So, so Without water, without food, without air, uh, without the heat of the sun, uh, we uh, we do not we do not exist. And so, so there's a, a way in which, when we don't look beyond the perception, which tends to objectify uh, as a solid, fixed, and separate identity, uh, whatever we're considering, whether it's ourself or another human being or a tree or, um, or an object um, like something made out of wood, um, you know, which was once a tree. Um, and, um, and so our perceptions tend to blind us to the interconnection. And so the, the Buddha says that the, this, this, is, um, this is very limiting and keeps us in ignorance of, of the wholeness that is, it's not that we don't exist in a differentiated um, existence. We do, you know, we are, I mean, each one of us will go home after this is over and we'll have our own um, lunch and, you know, we'll do our own activities, uh, it, you know, but, but those having lunch is itself an interdependent uh, experience, right? So, so we can experience uh, when we, you know, as we, as we have lunch, we, we, can, we can recognize, oh, yes, this self needs nourishment is dependent, uh, is not solo, is not separate. Um, yeah, so, you know, so uh, this is, uh, you know, this, the stick, the stick sermon <laughs> that I've given many <laughs> times. And, you know, so we look at, we look at the stick uh, and, and we, you know, we think it's a thing, it's a piece of wood and it's separate. Um, and, um, and it has a function and we don't think about it any further. But, you know, if we, you know, as I, as I say this, I kind of see these invisible 
threads, you know, connecting this stick to everything else because um, this stick came from a tree. It also has some kind of felt on it, which, um, you know, came from some material, I'm not sure what. Uh, and um, some kind of uh, plant probably, maybe cotton or some other plant. Um, and um, so the tree, the tree is an organism that needs certain uh, elements to exist. It needs sun, it needs rain. Um, you know, as we're learning about trees these days uh, in books like um, the, the, um, the Hidden Life of Trees, uh, trees need community also, the community of other trees. And um, trees need certain minerals in the earth. And those minerals come from the, the dying phase of stars and and so have traveled through um, millions of light years billions of light years to arrive here on earth and and so this stick is you know is also made of stardust as the expression is and and it's also made you know like that's those are the elements but there's also human artistry and craftsmanship and tradition of how you know long the stick is these little ribs that are carved into the stick on a lathe and you know how these are done um, so these you know what are the tools that were made human ingenuity human tradition human culture is in this stick um, where was this stick made? Like, was it made, you know, maybe it was made in some place uh, where uh, the tradition exists for making these, these kinds of sticks used with these uh, singing bowls. And, and so, you know, who made this stick? A human being made this stick. Uh, were they paid a living wage? Was there was there some kind of you know social injustice uh, done in the creation of the stick? I suspect yes. I suspect that that um, if the stick were made in North America, it would be. Um, person would have been paid differently but even so even in here in, in our country there's a lot of exploitation and um, um, people being not paid um, what their work deserves not being given the means to live with dignity so um, there's a lot, there's a lot in the stick. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I haven't given this, uh, the stick sermon in a long time, uh, but when I pick up the stick, I remember it um, because it's meaningful to me to remember that this, this sounding stick, which I, which I, it's an object that I have a lot of fondness for, um, and uh, and so it it's brings me into connect into inter interconnection, and you know what? So we can we can cultivate this kind of awareness that we. There's a word that uh, Dan Siegel uses to express that we are intraconnected. So when we think of interconnection, we think of you know I'm connected to other people, I'm connected to my environment. So it's a kind of a dualistic uh, expression it, aiming toward a sense of our part being part of the whole. But, 
but the word intraconnected, it's kind of like the word interbeing that Thich Nhat Hanh uses, it points toward that we are aware of being, we, we, we each of us has a sense of being a, 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 a conscious, aware, subjective self, you know, where Buddhism doesn't negate that in any way whatsoever. In fact, if anything, it liberates, <laughs> the teachings liberate that, that sense of presence, which is our inner being. And at the same time that we recognize that we are in a community of subjective life forms, not all human, the subjectivity of, you know, the bird that is chirping, uh, uh, the subjectivity, whatever it may be, of the, um, the, the plant life that is around us. Um, certainly there's a sensitivity. We may not call it subjectivity in the way that, you know, it's, it's, it's really an unknown field as to, you know, what is, what is consciousness and, and where is it, you know, where are beings on the spectrum? Certainly we can say that, that um, plant life uh, is sensitive. Um, scent, plant life, trees, you know, have a sense, some sense of connection and caring about the, the life around them. So to, to have this sense of this intra-subjectivity, interbeing, intra-connection, that's a word that's being used. So maybe, and, and, and that the me and the we is somehow conjoined in the word mui, it's a, it's a coining of a new word, mui. And, and our perception, bringing this back to perception, our, our ordinary perception, which is valuable, so valuable, that can we recognize that when we're clinging to a certain perception, clinging to the label of that this is that and I am not that, but that somehow we, there is a life in whatever that is, the tree outside the window, the, the plant in the room, um, that somehow we are engaged. I mean, even in the, on the very simple level of the exchange of car carbon dioxide and oxygen um, that happens with, with plant life. So, so there's a we that we can contemplate that we, you know, and it brings us beyond the perception of just seeing something as a solo separate object, whether it's ourselves or something else. Um, so it's finding that you know, not, not to get lost in the sense of the collectivity, because there have been ideologies which in a way negate the individual value of a person, right? You know, that like it's, it, it's all about the collective. Um, so finding that, that these can, exist together in, uh, in a, an intra-dependent, intra-connected uh, way. Um, and I think this contemplation brings us um, beyond ordinary perception um, into, you know, so, you know, we, we look around, we see things and, um, and can we keep looking? You know, there's just so we look, we see, we name, we label, and then can we keep looking and see deeper? Uh, and and that brings us into the mystery of 
anything because what I mean, I mean, I'm a mystery to myself, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and certainly, you know, e each one of you is a mystery to me. You are have a depth uh, and have a potentiality that is beyond my, uh, you know, superficial knowing. Even if we're old friends, like some of some of us are uh, in this uh, in this gathering, uh, we've known each other for many years, and and still we're the mysteries to each other. And that you know that that superficiality of perception. You know, so we're it's an invitation not to cling to that, not to attach to that, but to keep looking more deeply to ponder, to not know, to be in the mystery of uh, witnessing that we are each a process. We're each an unfolding process and everything around us is an unfolding process. And even the stick, you know, as much as it may not have changed to my capacity to see it, I know that um, just by ha handling it every day, uh, I've changed it. Um, and I know that not in my lifetime, probably, unless there's a fire somewhere, but it, it will become a heap of dust. And, um, and so will we all. And uh, in whatever way uh, that happens. So, uh, so s just bringing that as well into that the impermanent nature, the, that each one of us is a process uh, arising, passing away uh, and integrating that into our perception of how we are, how we inter are uh, in our lives. So let's, um, let's sit with that and then we'll have some time after the sitting to to maybe reflect on our experience of sitting, uh, what came up for us. Uh, not to think necessarily about teaching, but just to be with your experience and to notice if perception um, of a thought, of, a, of an emotion, of a sensation becomes fixed in your mind as something that is that you wanna hold on to or get rid of or uh, shouldn't be there in your ideas, your opinion, uh, or or should be more of this, or it should always be like this. I, you know, there's a sense of peace or calmness, and oh yeah, this is how it's supposed to always be. I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so please take a minute to just get up and stretch if you want. Um, yeah, yeah, feel free to. Give the body, be kind to the body, and uh, and then there's also a chair if you want to take a different posture for the sitting. You're welcome to do that. Pause for a moment. So let's let's come home to being present in the body, feeling the body sitting on the earth.
feeling the breath in the body. Noticing perception of breath. Do we know what breath is? That we breathe is a miracle of evolution. In the Pali language, anapana means breathing in and breathing out. And the word pana, anapana, is akin of the same root as prana in Sanskrit, which in yoga teaching is. Um, used to point to the life energy. So in the Buddhist teaching, there is an awareness that that breath is something that energizes life. And we we conjoin awareness with breath. To bring our awareness deep into the body filling the whole body in whatever way that manifests for you. Bringing awareness to a sense of the whole body. And it doesn't have to be perfect. There may be parts of the body that feel kind of numb or in shadow, it's okay. Exploring what it means to be aware of the whole body. And resting awareness in the body. You may rest awareness in the crown of the head, the place in the forehead, is uh, said to be a, a place of the wisdom eye. Or situate awareness at the heart, the belly. Resting awareness and letting it radiate into a sense of the whole body. Letting this resting in the body, however you discover it, be your home base. When the mind gets caught up, drifts away, you come home.
Noticing sound. How is the perception of sound being known? The mind labels. There's here, there's some kind of sound of a machine in the distance. Mind labels. Maybe there's an arising of a feeling tone of pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Maybe there's some kind of reactivity around the feeling tone of liking it, wanting more, perhaps something like a bird sound, or even maybe a machine. Or maybe there's not wanting it, finding it unpleasant and wanting it to disappear. So, Perception, feelings, the Vedna co-arises often with perception. So a machine sound arises and the perception is it's a machine sound and the feeling may be unpleasant and the clinging may be this is my meditation time and I don't want to hear a machine. Pristine silence or only pleasant sounds. So the mind gets caught. So we can simply be mindful of these, mindful of the perception, mindful of the feeling tone, mindful of the reactivity. Let sound be sound, let feelings be feelings. And when we let go of the reactivity, when we are mindful of it, even if it persists, we're not caught in the same way. We may notice a sense of caughtness, stuckness in not wanting or wanting. But we're not identified in the same way with it. So mindfulness, if it doesn't release it, it at least lo loosens our grip. Letting life be what it is. Letting life unfold as it does. In the muiness, in the unfolding, intra-being of being with everything as it is.
as we come to the end of our practice time together, formal practice time. Let's touch how we've been blessed, open our hearts to receive whatever insight has arisen, acceptance, kindness, letting go, release. These are all blessings that we receive in our practice and bringing awareness to them and bringing gratitude for them helps us to really be nourished by them. We deeply acknowledging the importance of how our practice nourishes us. And as we are nourished, we can also share this nourishment with those around us. We can bring this intention, this, this will uh, to, to share this blessing. Um, in Buddhism, the word merit, uh, the English word merit is used, um, which kind of feels a little bit impenetrable to my mind, but, but I use the word blessing, goodness, uh, to understand it better. And, um, and so we can share the goodness of our practice with others. And so I invite you to bring to mind uh, people that you know or that you don't know, or places, circumstances where you want to share the blessing of your practice, the compassion, the wisdom, the freedom. May our practice and our lives serve and support the happiness, well being, and liberation of all beings. So the question was, um, or the comment is like seeing oneself kind of form the same kind of relationship uh, with, you know, the, the patterns which are painful, not supportive, not, I'm filling in the blanks, not, not the kind of partnership that you're looking for in a relationship of love and acceptance. Um, and, um, and yeah, why, why do we do that? Why do we, why do we repeat these patterns? I mean, that, that I, first of all, I just want to, I'm sure that you're not the only one who has experienced that and that people can relate to that kind of, um, you know, falling into these these habits of mind are deep, um, and um, and I don't I don't have an answer. All I can say is that um, we keep learning. You know, we keep learning, and um, maybe. Uh, maybe this relationship 
um, you began to recognize a little bit sooner. Um, I don't know, but maybe. Um, does anybody know the, uh, the little teaching poem called um, Autobiography in Five Chapters? Is that, it's an old kind of, uh, um, it's, a, it's a, a 70s thing. Um, anyway, I, I don't even remember the name of the author. Portia somebody. Um, so I'll try to say it as, as uh, best I can, uh, rather than looking for it somewhere on my computer. So um, autobiography in five chapters. I walk down the street. <clears throat> There's a deep hole in the street. I don't see it. I fall in. It's really hard to get out. It takes me a long time, and I'm covered with dirt. I'm, I'm kind of uh, embellishing. <laughs> uh, and, but I get out. I'm okay. I walk down the street again. There's a big hole in the street. I kind of know it's there, but I fall in anyway. It takes a lot to get out but I get out a little bit sooner. I'm okay. I walk down the street. There's a hole in the street. I see it. I fall in anyway. I get out pretty quickly. I walk down the street. There's a big hole in the street. I walk around it. I walk down a different street. So that's, I think that was five chapters. <laughs> anyway, we do, it's, we do fall in the same hole again and again. And the, the conditionings are deep and, and we need to forgive ourselves and we need to have compassion for ourselves uh, when we do fall in those holes. And, um, and sometimes we fall in holes and it's not just ourselves that get hurt uh, and we need to have compassion for ourselves and in whatever ways we can try to make it right with those that we've hurt. <laughs>